Hello and welcome. My name is Felice Darko. I'm a pediatric neuroradiologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. And this is a presentation uh, on brain tumors in children, in particularly differential diagnosis of posterior fossa tumors. And I would like to thank you, the Ukrainian Society of Radiology, for the invitation. So let's start from um, uh, warm up cases. This is, uh, these are two patients with the midline mass with fairly benign um, appearances on uh, uh, MR, but uh, um, they are both on the midline, this lesion, but um, one is infratentorial, one is supratentorial. I'm telling you, I'm showing you this case because um, six uh, years ago, these two um, tumors will, will have been reported uh, as different entities with different prognosis. Now we know that this is exactly the same tumor. I will not tell you now the answer, but later on in the presentation, but keep in mind these images. Same thing here, we have two patients with uh, this time nasty looking uh, mass uh, um, in the pontocerebellar angle, here more cystic, but the most important feature is the striking diffusion restriction that means hypercellularity. Uh, six years to seven years ago, we will have reported this as two embryonal aggressive tumors. Now we know that one of these two patients has a very good prognosis. The other one has a very bad prognosis. Again, I will tell you the answer later on. And now the third case, one midline aggressive restricting mass in the fourth ventricle, another in the um, um, cerebellar hemisphere, so slightly different location, both of them infratentorial, both of them aggressive. Both of them, I'm telling you, will look exactly the same on the microscope, but actually uh, they will have very different uh, uh, molecular um, characteristic and also different prognosis. Why is the, all these differences? All these differences in the radiological interpretation came out after the 2016 um, uh, classification of brain tumor in the central nervous system. An update is coming out now because every year there are new knowledge, um, uh, new, new, new insights coming out about the molecular profile of these tumors, which is the focus of this classification. It's not longer uh, histological uh, appearances, but actually the molecular um, um, characteristic of this tumor that uh, um, uh, determined uh, uh, be, uh, the uh, behavior of these entities. And as you can see in this uh, paper from Toronto, imaging is now expected not only to lead uh, to a relevant short differential diagnosis, but sometimes to aid in predicting the specific tumor and subtype, and possibly the prognosis. And this is what we call radiogenomics. So you need to know what's going on in terms of new classification of tumor in order to understand um, how to manage your differential diagnosis. And this will be the focus of this short presentation. In particular, I will speak about posterior fossa tumor, but not all the so when you think of posterior fossa tumor, you need to divide them in embryonal tumor and non-embryonal tumor. The embryonal tumor are normally more aggressive, not all of them, and some non-embryonal tumor are aggressive, but the main radiological characteristic is diffusion restriction. And why they show diffusion restriction? Because on the microscope, they look like that. A lot of packed blue cell, round blue cells, so high cellularity, so very dense um, cellularity, meaning diffusion restriction, and also meaning CT hyperdensity. So you can use the CT to at least uh, try to differentiate whether or not this is an embryonal tumor. And this is the basic um, diagnostic appear, um, radiological characteristic the, uh, of um, uh, medulloblastoma, which is the most important embryonal tumor. You can see the density on CT is very similar, apart from the two calcification here, it's very similar to the cortex, which is quite packed um, uh, tissue in terms of uh, cellular density. It can be enhancement or not, T2 variable, but most important findings is the diffusion restriction. So. Uh, density in CT and restriction on MR are very, very important. And uh, 
in 2012, uh, again, the group of Toronto, which is really leading in terms of uh, uh, diagnosis, molecular characterization of uh, pediatric brain tumor, uh, realized and published that there are at least four main subgroup of what we call medulloblastoma. So medulloblastoma is something that is identified on the microscope and can have classic histology, uh, large cell, anaplastic histology, and desmoplastic nodular. But all of them were classified as medulloblastoma. But what we know now is that there are four types, four subgroups, uh, different from the um, um, age group point of view. Histologically, there is a lot of overlap. All of them can be classic or large um, anaplastic uh, cells. Uh, only this group, uh, uh, the second group, the sonic edge of can be uh, can show this uh, desmoplastic nodular appearance, which shows this nodular uh, areas of enhancement. Uh, but the prognosis goes from a very good one to a very poor one. So that's very important that things that look exactly the same on the microscope are actually they can have actually very different prognosis. And this is to, uh, due to different genetic profile. So let's start from the sonic edge of. The reason why I will show you how the embryological um, development is different from this tumor is because we can use the embryological pathway um, of, uh, of the different subgroup to understand why they look slightly different on images and we can do a, a molecular differential diagnosis. So, sonic hedgehog, normally in the development of the cerebellum, you have cerebellar gran granule neuron progenitors in the external granular layer. In the normal developing uh, cerebellum, you have the sonic edge of pathway activated, proliferation, and then mi migration deep to the Purkin gene cell that in the adult cerebellum um, are, or the, 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 the fully developed cerebellum are in the external part of it. Okay? What happens if the sonic edge is abnormally uh, hyperactivated? There, there is tumorigenesis, so hyperproliferation. The migration is stopped. So these cells are stuck on the surface. Why this is important? Because this is embryonal tumor. So it's restricting because of the high cellularity, but it will be stuck in the external granular cell. So this is why this masses looks like embryonal tumor in the very periphery of the um, of the cerebellum, and they look, look at this case, they look almost extra -axial. This uh, is from Perot, 2014, American Journal of Neuroradiology. This is something from the ESNR Clinical Neuroradiology textbook that we published. So this is an embryonal tumor because of the diffusion restriction, is a sonic edge of medulloblastoma because of the peripheral location. What about wingless? Wingless tumor, they are not cerebellar cells but they derive from brainstem cells that during the development, they start from the fourth ventricle, they go down and laterally in the cerebellar pontine angle, and then they reach the brainstem. So the tumorigenesis uh, happens um, somewhere during this uh, path, and uh, this is why these uh, tumors again will show diffusion restriction, but will be uh, sometimes, not all the time, in the pontocerebellar angle. Unfortunately, it's a minority of these cases, but remember that this, these um, tumors, they have a very good prognosis. So you, if you see something here stuck in the pontocerebellar angle with diffusion restriction in a child that is not very young, and I will tell you afterwards why this is important, like six, seven, think of medulloblastoma WNT activated, um, which means good prognosis. So this is very, very important. Uh, the group three and four, uh, the, the, the embryological origin, the genetics is not so well known. Some people divide in group three and four, some other they just call non-sonic edge, non-wingless, but they have a poorer prognosis and sometimes cannot enhance. They are typically midline in location, and uh, you can see, I show you before, this is the typical medulloblastoma with diffusion restriction. This is a type four, uh, and uh, you can see that there is no enhancement sometimes, and sometimes they can have uh, leptomeningeal dissemination at diagnosis because of the very aggressive behavior, more than the other subgroups. So just to recap, location in the posterior fossa is very, very important. 
if you have something stuck in the pontocerebellar angle uh, in a child that is seven, eight, so not a very young child, um, think of WNT. In the periphery of the um, brain stem, think of sonic edgeock. In the center, so in the midline, think of group three or four, or so-called no WNT, no sonic edgeock uh, medulloblastoma, uh, that can have uh, um, poor or intermediate prognosis. Remember that according to some author, the group four, if you want to divide between the two, is the one that tends to enhance less. But it's important that this is, once again, um, a family of embryonal tumor. So remember that they will show diffusion restriction. But also remember that these things that now we know being completely different entities, they all appear very similar on microscope. So the warmer cases I show you before show two things that look exactly the same on the microscope. They look very similar in terms of imaging characteristics, but different location. Midline location, group three or four. A peripheral location, sonic edge. Of. This has poor prognosis, this intermediate prognosis. Now, um, there are several uh, publications, and one is under review that we are uh, now going to publish, that this characterization works almost in two thirds of the cases for some molecular groups like WNT even less. And why is that? Well, let's come back to embryology. This is a wingless in the midline. Why is that? Because I told you that wingless uh, um, tumors, medulloblastoma, derive from cells that goes from the center of the fourth ventricle to the brainstem. But the, the tumor genesis can start at every time in this path. So what if uh, tumor genesis starts here? It will look exactly like the midline group three and four. So in this case, you cannot distinguish. Same thing for the sonic edge that is derived from the external um, granular cell, progenitor granular cells in the cerebellum, which is this. And as you can say, see, if it starts from the vermin granular cell, it will look exactly the same. So when it's in the midline, it's very difficult to be sure that this is a group three and four. While if it's stuck in the pontocerebellar angle and the child is six, seven, eight years old, so not an infant, or if it's in the periphery and both restricting, you can be more sure that these are respectively um, WNT and sonic edge. Okay. Another embryonal tumor, again, diffusion restriction, is the atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. And uh, typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor also have predilection for the pontocerebellar angle, but they can be everywhere in the brain as infratentorial, supratentorial. They have uh, often this peripheral cystic appearance and they can or not enhance. So an, are a bit more heterogeneous, but very similar to uh, WNT um, um, uh, medulloblastoma. The problem is the age, because um, these children are very young, less than three years old. Also for uh, uh, ATRT, we have subgrouping. Uh, the main three groups is sonic edge of tyrosine activated and uh, MIC activated with some differences in location. You see, for instance, tyrosine is much more common in the posterior fossa and has this peripheral cyst, but actually the prognosis is very similar. Uh, so um, this is more important for the therapeutic point of view because they are trying to develop some, some drugs that can act uh, to the different activated pathway. But for the, the diagnostic point of view, just keep in mind that there are some differences, but it's not so relevant as for medulloblastoma at this moment. Things are changing fast. And this is a typical example of restricting mass in the pontocerebellar angle, two-year-old male, so very young child, peripheral cyst. This is an ATRT tyrosine activated. So the other warm-up case showed two children with a mass in the pontocerebellar angle, restricting, but this is quite old. This is a very good prognosis, WNT. This is quite young, very bad prognosis, ATRT, uh, atypical teratorhabdoid tumor, uh, most likely tyrosine activated. The last embryonal tumor is called ATMR, embryonal tumor with multilayer rosette, which is typically very big with large areas of restriction, poorly enhancing, and look at the absence of edema, very critical difference from glioblastomas, for instance, in adults. And this is 
the uh, um, very beautiful uh, paper from Novak, and this is a slide that my colleagues, Dr. Lebel, gave it to me. All these uh, uh, ATMR are characterized again by a molecular abnormality, uh, and they have this C. 19 MC altered, but uh, uh, for a radiologist it's important that very few of them have perifocal edema, all of them are restriction, and they can have heterogeneous enhancement. Now let's go to the second group, which is the known embryo posterior fossa tumor, and we have the classic pilocytic astrocytoma, solidocystic enhancing lesion, but the most important thing is that they do not show restriction, because sometimes they do not have this cystic lesion, they are in the middle and difficult to distinguish from a medulloblastoma unless you look at the restriction or at the CT density. Why is that important? Because you need to trust restriction over the advanced techniques. Spectroscopy can look like a GBM because of the proteinaceous content of the pilocytic and um, um, the perfusion because of these leaking vessels can be very, very high. So perfusion and spectroscopy can mislead you, can fool you. And uh, the non embryonic tumor I, could, I call the, the, bad, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, because it helps me to remember how they look like, and uh, like the movie from, from um, Sergio Leone with Clint Eastwood. So this is the good, but you see it's not so good, it's not smiling too much, because 10% of the pilocytes astrocytoma, especially the one that are not in posterior fossa, can show, um, or not cerebellar one, can show, um, uh, metastatic dissemination. What about the brainstem? So uh, the brainstem tumors are um, different depending on the location. If they develop from the midbrain and the um, medulla oblongata, they are generally benign. In the pons, especially in the ventral pons, they are generally malignant. In the posterior pons with esophytic, you can have benign tumor. And this is the typical esophytic midbrain a solidocystic, not restricting pilocytic astrocytoma. If it's in the ventral pons, you are um, dealing most likely with an entity that is called diffuse midline glioma, which is uh, the new name for the diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. All of these patients are characterized according to the WHO classification as uh, diffuse midline glioma if they have the Easton 3 K27 mutation. They can have variable histology, but they all look like that. A large expansile mass within the pons encasing the basilar artery. Most of them, they do not have contrast. They do not have hyperfusion. These are spared white matter. Uh, but nevertheless, they are very, very aggressive. They can have some areas of T2 hypo intensity or um, um, some, uh, some um, aggressive uh, uh, areas in terms of enhancement that may be the more aggressive part of the tumor, but generally they look quite benign. Sometimes they look aggressive, like in this case, like a GBM, and this doesn't change. Both of them, despite the difference of appearance of radiology, they have on radiology, they have a bad prognosis. And if you are interested in uh, how to follow up this tumor. Um, well, keep in mind that the RAPNO group just came out with a paper on assessment uh, of uh, uh, diffuse midline gliomas, and I also did um, a lecture on, uh, on that topic, which is on my YouTube channel, if you are interested. I, show, I told you again, there are some internal areas of heterogeneity, T2 hypo intensity, restriction, maybe perfusion and sometimes enhancement. This is subtraction T1 that show better, shows better the areas of enhancement. This can be the so-called anaplastic areas, but this is only an hypothesis. They changed the name from um, DIPG to diffuse midline glioma because they realized that this mutation and this bad prognosis can be also related to tumors that are not in the pons, but in the thalamus, always in the midline, but in the thalamus and in the spinal cord. So the focus is not uh, supratentorial versus uh, infratentorial anymore, but midline versus off midline, where midline have this histone mutation, while off midline they have other uh, mutation, not the K27M. And this is another example of two GBM, so histologically, again, remember the difference between histology and molecular findings. So histologically, these are both glioblastoma, but actually one has the K27 mutation, and one has the G34 mutation. So 
at the moment the, the prognosis is bad for both of them and in the future with the molecular um, therapy this can can make a difference to complicate the things and i'm telling you there are a lot of uh, this uh, c impact paper so this group that that, that, that publish when new evidence came out um, and uh, on this basis will be the new um, uh, classification of the of the tumor so the new update who classification so look for it uh, but they basically found uh, the histone mutation that was thought at the beginning to be characteristic of the IPG also in non midline benign tumor like pyrocytic astrocytoma, ependymoma, glioma. Ependymoma is not benign, but to say other kind of tumor. So now they say you need to have this mutation, but the, the um, child has to be the, the tumor in the midline to be classified as diffuse midline glioma, i.e., bad prognosis. And then you start to think where is the midline? You know, how much offline can be the midline and so on. So it's, it's becoming complicated. We don't know everything about that, but we need to know that there is, this is an evolving field. Then we, we go to the ugly one, the ependymoma with this typical toothpaste appearance going toward the foramina and a lot of cyst and uh, in, in uh, heterogeneous enhancement. So this is why it's more the ugly and intermediate to low uh, ADC values with some areas of restriction in terms of um, in, in case of anaplastic ependymoma. The important thing is that it's not important for the prognosis if the ependymoma is anaplastic or not. So histology is less important in comparison to the uh, molecular group. And again, the ependymoma they have uh, different molecular groups. So you see the ugly with this uh, uh, heterogeneous enhancement areas of uh, hemorrhages, uh, cystic areas, uh, um, going toward the foramen of Lushka, and a lot of enhancing lesion in this anaplastic ependymoma with the restriction that is heterogeneous, but quite prominent. So I show you this case just to show you how difficult it can be sometimes to distinguish from a medulloblastoma if you don't look very carefully for the um, diffusion uh, restriction. But we have also supratentorial ependymoma. They, this is a rela fusion positive, very aggressive looking, a tumor with diffusion restriction, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have a lot of different molecular subgroups divided by location, supratentorial, posterior fossa, um, spine, and the age is different, the prognosis is very different. So supratentorial we have YAP1, RELA, infratentorial we have group A, group B, and look at the prognosis, group A, very, very bad, group B, quite good. So can we distinguish? Well, let's focus only on the posterior fossa. Group A and group B, they have similar histology. So they look exactly the same, but the group B has similar prognosis to the phyllocytic astro. So you don't look or you don't rely anymore on histology. You rely on the molecular subgroup. And look at the histology, exactly the same. The problem is that group A younger lateral location uh, and completely different molecular profile group b uh, is actually uh, uh, for older patients and they go very uh, you know much better so when you have a child there are a lot of chances that unfortunately this will be a group a and the child will die um, unless the operation can be um, a very good total resection and just to show you group a younger age with brainstem displaced laterally, the obex more or less clear, uh, and uh, more frequent extension on the cerebellar pontine angle. There are at least two papers showing this difference. The first one is uh, by Jean-Marie uh, King uh, from, um, from uh, um, Guys and St. Thomas and Evelina Children's Hospital when he was in Toronto. Uh, if you have some older uh, patient or a uh, or a young adult with a posterior fossa tumor in the central location, they have generally better prognosis and the obex is infiltrated. So that's very, very important. Finally, a couple of tips. So uh, they remove the P-net and now we call embryonal tumor. Um, if there is C19MC, we call it ATMR, but this is molecular diagnosis. So we should call them in keeping with embryonal tumor. And then if we think this can be a medulloblastoma, we attempt some, some more specific diagnosis. 
they remove the gliomatosis cerebri, which is not longer an entity, but is still a descriptive term for this infiltrative uh, supratentorial uh, tumors, astrocyt astrocytic tumors that are more common in adults, but we can have also in children. And this is a flow chart that we publish. And now we are trying to publish an, an, another flow chart that is a bit more complicated and a bit more effective. So um, uh, look out for the possible publication um, on AJNR. And uh, a couple of interesting cases. Look at this lesion. It looks quite benign, looks almost like a focal cortical dysplasia, but it restricts like hell. No enhancement, trust restriction. This was an ATMR. The child is young. Unfortunately, there are exceptions. Look at this child, this uh, almost um, again restricting with the cystic area, um, a lot of enhancement. Quite, you know, it looks like a small GBM, but it was a ganglioglioma. So in this case, the, the diffusion restriction was um, a bit misleading, but these are rare exceptions. So in my opinion, trust the diffusion first. And the trust the diffusion also because some of the medulloblastoma, ATRT and ATMR, as I show you, can uh, you know sometimes do not enhance. So when you have something like that, you see this is artifact or nodule of metastatic disease. This is vessel or metastatic disease. This was a child operated for medulloblastoma. If you look at the diffusion, it's clear that these are metastasis, and uh, you can see there is not much enhancement here but the diffusion in the follow-up shows a clear progress. So use the diffusion also for the follow-up. And these are the people I would like to um, thanks. And this is um, Amalfi and the Amalfi cost when I'm from. So when the um, COVID uh, crisis uh, will be over, please come and visit. Thank you very much.